Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1.30 to 2 o'clock session of the 2023 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are pleased to introduce the presentation, the Open Metaverse Research Group. Our speaker is Michael Lorry. Mike Lorry. Mike is currently a director of the International Space Flight Museum with facilities in Second Life and Kitely, and he is founder of Galactic Systems and the Galactic Virtual World Grid. He co-founded the OMRG earlier this year. Please check out the website at conference.opensimilar.org for speaker bios, details of his session, and the full schedule of events. This session is being live streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag pound OSCC23. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin the session. Over to you, Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry, we had some um, malfunctions on some slides here, so I'm going to be in the middle there. Uh, so, yeah, as said, um, a group of us uh, from the Space Flight Museum and a few other organizations uh, got together a little over a year ago to start the Open Metaverse Research Group because we were kind of getting frustrated with, um, there was a lot of, I don't know, kind of uh, fractionating, I, I guess you can call it, in both this community as well as in other metaverse communities and things seem, seem to be just splitting off in many directions and not really working on what we felt were some of the core problems in uh, really making the metaverse uh, ha happen and be popular. And so, because uh, really with the COVID lockdown, it really should have taken off a lot better in our opinion than it did. And so we started thinking, brainstorming on ideas. So we're meeting every Friday at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, in a re in a region in Kitely, and I'll put up a, a link to the uh, to where to go if you want to participate, and as well as to our Discord. Um, and so, we uh, there's some core areas that's that are important to us that that we found uh, were number one is as we were talking about in the previous session about using blockchain. Um, in there's a huge problem with um, portability of assets across the hypergrid, not just in OpenSim uh, across the hypergrid, but you know between different platforms as well as um, persistence of identity. Um, you know if you belong to one grid and that grid poofs, you know you lose your avatar name and, and everything in your inventory and you've got to go someplace else and rebuild from scratch. And people wind up having to create, avatars on a number of grids just because of the difficulty of, of transporting assets from one place to another, as well as getting around the hypergrid occasionally. And so the, the obvious solution from my experience is that what we need is an asset system that is common to all grids on the hypergrid so that you have what you know your whatever avatar name you have is your identity and it's independent of any grid and your inventory is independent of any grid and so the really the only way to do that in a secure manner that actually protects uh ip rights of creators um while allowing that kind of portability is clearly a blockchain based asset system and so the way that works is that you have a, and I, I'm trying to get, show the graphic for that, and it's not letting me show that, uh, unfortunately. Um, I had a great graphic to show it, but basically, um, the idea is that you know the assets, whether they're you know Im images or objects or sounds or whatever, um, can be items that are the creator basically locks up in uh, somewhere on in the cloud on typically on the ipfs and you then create a smart contract that on the, on a blockchain that basically if someone signs that smart contract they have access to that asset that's out on the cloud and they can then res it uh, wherever the contract permits it and so one good prototype example of that type of virtual world is uh, Decentraland, which I talked about a few years ago here. And 
Uh, but, you know, it has its own problems because of, you know, the some of the ideas that the founders of, of Decentraland had in, in creating that platform. And but the the core idea of having a blockchain ba based asset system is really good. The air, one problem that was an issue was uh, dealing with really uh, actually protecting uh, creator rights, because, of course, you know, I create a cube, I put it on the blockchain, and then somebody else tries to come along and says, hey, I created this cube before you did, um, you know, but, and even if you did, um, I got it in the blockchain first, so I have it protected. So there needs to be some sort of a dispute resolution system, and those are entirely possible. So the two ideas we have for creating that sort of an IP protection system is that when you want to upload something with a, to a smart contract on the blockchain, that there are heuristics using uh, an idea called uh, perceptual hashes. Um, no, there's blockchain size is not a problem. Um, there is absolutely no problem with blockchain size. Uh, that's that's a, that's a fallacy that's promoted in the media. Sorry, and so the um, perceptual hashes are different from. Uh, crypto hashes. So a, a crypto hash is that you used to see when you're doing downloads, like if one bit of an entire file is different, the whole hash is diff a totally different number, right? But a perceptual hash is different from that because it is only different in the hash number based upon the percent commonality of that object with something else. Okay, so you can generate a perceptual hash for one object and then you can generate a perceptual hash for another similar object and the difference between the two hashes will tell you how co much commonality there is between those those two objects and so that's a very uh, good tool that can be used to determine how common one upload is with another and thus spot someone trying to upload something that may have been ripped off or maybe they just didn't upload it to this platform before a ripper got it before them. And so so the assets are stored, as I said earlier, on the IP, IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, is a cloud service that's available worldwide. So you can put your assets and there can be cryptographically secured with a public key uh, uh, system. And so the smart contract then uh, is connected to that uh, secured asset that's on IPFS. So you don't have to worry about having a huge asset server on your grid if you have a blockchain based asset system. So uh, once you have the perceptual hashes uh, being used to check uploads, let's say someone, a ripper, uploads my thing that he got some from a platform I was using it on and they get get it into this blockchain before I do. Well, all you have to do is if you are trying to upload it now and it says, hey, this is already registered, you then can start a dispute resolution system. And there are blockchain based dispute resolution systems already in practice that can be adopted for this sort of thing. And it's a very simple uh, fact finding system that has been proven in a couple of different applications already. So this is not a new technology. So, um, you know, benefits of this sort of thing are not just protecting the IP rights of creators, but also the persistence of uh, the uh, avatar identity and inventory across grids. Um, at the same time, because the grid owners would not be having to manage a ballooning asset server of their own grid, they would uh, then turn, uh, using the blockchain asset server, they would operate nodes that would process all the transactions of the blockchain and earn money from those transaction fees and turn an asset system from a cost center on their grid operation to a profit center for their grid operation. And that makes operating an open SIM grid a lot more economically feasible for people. Um, and with new blockchain technologies, you know, most people, when you think of blockchain, you're thinking of stuff like Bitcoin, 
or Ethereum where the transaction fees are rather high to do a single transaction. And for virtual worlds, we need really microtransactions and micro fees. And that's entirely possible with newer blockchain technologies like uh, Hedera Hashgraph, like um, AVAX and other platforms that can handle, they have very fast throughput with very low transaction fees, you know, less than a penny. And at the same time, they have very high transaction uh, speeds, which means, you know, instead of the three transactions per second of, of Bitcoin and the seven transactions per second of Ethereum when it was on proof of work, now it's on proof of stake and it can do tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. As uh, Hedera and AVAX and, and some of the other technologies can easily do tens to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Now, the reason this transaction per second rate is important, if you have kept up with uh, hypergrid business, several years ago, uh, Elon Tochner of Kitely uh, had an argument against using blockchain, where he argued that the second life economy uh, size for, for if you're having that kind of an economy for a virtual world, you would need a transaction rate of 6,000 6, transactions per second. And at the time, there weren't any blockchain technologies that were in action in back in 2017, 2018 that could do that, but now there are. So that's not really a counter argument against that proposal. Tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Right. And so with that sort of thing, uh, we've got a viable alternative to the very uh, uh, fr fractured uh, asset system that makes it so hard really to make the hypergrid work effectively for people in OpenSim. And this can be applied not just to OpenSim, but to other platforms. Um, and so there's one project that's that's uh, been in operation for about a year that's a, a startup started by Neil Stevenson, who authored uh, Snow Crash. Who, which uh, was the novel that um, that uh, Patrick uh, the, uh, that uh, Philip Rosedale said uh, was the inspiration for Second Life, and uh, his blockchain project is specifically targeted for providing a uh, blockchain backbone for virtual reality uh, and virtual world projects, and that's called Lamina One, and the the one is a, a digit. So um, you can Google that and check them out. They have a Discord and so forth. Um, and so we're keeping track of, yes, thank you. And so we're keeping track of that project and I encourage people to, to look at that because they seem to have a pretty good um, idea of what's going on. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that we've been uh, talking about for the past year. In addition to that, um, we've been uh, talking with, uh, well, Ada Radius, who's here is, is another one of our members and she's been working with Kayaker Magic and Owl Eyes on creating a new uh, avatar system for uh, the viewer that is in, number one, allows you to have a much more improved system avatar, but also lets people create their own custom avatars with a blender add-on that's been, that Owlize created, and then in, install that, that customized avatar into the system avatar folder on Firestorm. And at present, that what that does is it changes all the avatars in your viewer, but not of anybody else. Uh, and so this would be something where a, a grid that wants to have a custom avatar, let's say they want everybody to look like elves or everyone to look like dwarves or, or like centaurs or, or mermaids, they'd make a custom avatar for that type of appearance and that would be the system avatar. And so they would basically distribute that, a, a version of Firestorm with that uh, system avatar installed in the distribution so that, uh, or at least an add-on that would install it in there for them. So um, each grid that wants to have custom system avatars can do that. In the future, we'll have a much more, uh, a much, much larger variety of uh, possible uh, system avatars that people will be able to use and they'll all be much better, higher quality than the, the, the current system. Um, so that's something that, that Ada is doing. She's gonna be, if she hasn't talked already about it, she'll be talking about it later. Um, and then other things we're talking about is creating new asset classes, for instance, with uh, physics based rendering. We want to. Let me get to 
this. Okay, here we go. Um, as many of you are aware of, uh, Linden Lab has been working on adding some additional uh, texture slots in the uh, edit dialog so that we can go beyond just the diffuse and normal and specular, but have other uh, features because what physics based rendering is basically using a number of different textures that are each one is dealing with the opt a single type of optical property like the you know the specularity the the normals the metallicity the roughness etc cetera, etc cetera. and so in you know CGI for movies or doing you know uh, current uh, cutting edge gaming the newer file formats like GLTF are allowing for a lot more different uh, slots for those different optical properties. And that's why we call it physics-based rendering because each texture that you apply for a single slot uh, deals with a different type of uh, op physics optics. And so that's what we call it PBR. And so uh, the idea of having additional uh, asset types, the, having a, a PBR material as a full asset type. So you could create a PBR material uh, in world as an asset and, and plug in uh, all the textures for that PBR material. So then that entire material could be distributed with all its uh, textures as an individual asset. Um, and you know, there's ideas for other assets that are similar to that that we've been working on. I encourage people to go to our our uh, wiki on our website to read that out to check that out um, so it provides a, a real good value add as a new type of asset class and here's a another important thing that we're suggesting is that uh, people should look seriously at uh, reducing the maximum size of textures in order to maintain grid performance is that um, if you have a, a, a standard for your grid of a maximum texture size of 2048 by 2048, and you add more textures of that size for PBR, that means that you have to, you know, for right now we have three possible textures for a, an object, uh, a single mesh, to cover just the normal diffuse and, uh, and specular. But if we add more, then that's more textures that may be that 2048 by 2048. And, but we can maintain grid performance by reducing the maximum image size. And because as you can see here with this uh, slide here is if you drop it to, let's say, you know, 1024 by 1024, then the same amount of memory and, and bandwidth that it requires to send one 2048 by 2048, you can send four different PBR textures and the same amount of time and same amount of memory and so if you have two of those and you can go to eight. And so with the current three you know, slots of diffuse, normal and specular, if you reduce the SOP max size from 2048 down to 1024, you can allow for the same grid performance to have 12 different PBR slots for each material. And that with that number of PBR slots, you can have real photorealism consistent with the best cutting edge video games using, for instance, like, you know, Unreal Engine and things like that, because that's how they achieve a lot of their uh, excellent uh, optics. Um, beyond that, we're, you know, we've been looking at new viewer technologies. Uh, one of our participants is Animats. Uh, he's the creator of the SharpView viewer. Uh, he's been creating his SharpView viewer to produce uh, much higher quality rendering with the same uh, existing uh, textures um, as the versus the regular Firestorm and the and the, the vanilla Second Life viewers. And another one is, of course, you probably heard of the Crystal Frost viewer, which is a Unity-based uh, Second Life and OpenSim viewer that allows for uh, using these platforms with a mobile device and that's a, a big advance as well so you know we're looking forward to seeing uh viewers that can add uh more new features beyond just these graphics and the newer programming technologies so um 
that's all I've got for today. Here's uh, info about where we are and how you can participate. Um, we meet every Friday at 1 p.m. We want to inc uh, invite everyone to participate. Um, you can come to the Cats uh, Autumn Castle region on Fridays at 1 p.m. Um, you can go to our website. It's a wiki. Uh, we just had to uh, upgrade it because there was a security weakness in the previous version. And uh, so if you want to participate in the wiki, you can join our Discord and uh, we'll get you a uh, editing account on the wiki and uh, have enjoy, we enjoy having you uh, co collaborate with us on, on creating these standards and proposals for improving not just OpenSim as an open metaverse, but uh, to create these as standards for uh, other metaverse platforms that, that seek to also be uh, have an open architecture. Do you have any other questions? I'm not sure, Lear, if you're there, but we need to wrap. Sounds good. And my apologies. I was fielding a comment from someone. Um, so far, you handled all the questions beautifully, Mike. And we thank you for that presentation. Great. Thanks for having me. As a reminder to our audience, you will want to check out the conference.opensimilar.org to see what is coming up on the conference schedule. You won't want to miss our next session, which begins at 2 p.m. in this keynote region, and it's entitled Max, the new free mesh bodies for OpenSIM avatars. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 23 poster expos and the sponsor and crowdfunder booths. Thank you.